Hello guys, thank you for being here. My name is Janaina Kunin. I'm an endocrinologist. I live in Brazil and I work with lots of metabolic diseases like diabetes, obesity, and also I love, love, love studying about cancer. And in my, my life story about cancer, which I'll tell you eventually, <laughs> I came across this person's book and this story of life, this example of life. And this is Jane McLennan's story. So Jane, thank you so much for being here. I'm so, so happy. Like <laughs> One of my doctor heroes, you know. I just, I, I love the fact that you, you do what you do, and you're working against the grain. You're not supported in what you do, but you know it works. So I'm delighted to be talking to you. <laughs> you know, the first time I heard about you, I was in Metabolic Health Summit, and I was yep. lost, like looking for answers and no one to talk to. And I came across right. Nasha Winters, and she said, "Oh, yep. Janaina, you're a doctor," and she was so excited from Brazil and. Wait, wait, have you read Jane's book? You have to start reading Jane's book. You like supplements? No, you have to read Jane's book. And then I said, Jane McLeland's? Okay, I didn't know the book. And I know it's how no. to starve your cancer. I said, okay, I'm going to buy it now. I remember buying it in Amazon, like at the spot, you know? I said, this is the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to eat this book from yeah. the beginning the, to the end. Metabolic health of it. The, the Metabolic Health Summit, they have a lot of books on display. They have never sold my book there. But that's disgusting, you know? I've asked them. I've asked them, and I don't know why, but anyway, hopefully next time... I'm going to do this. I'm going to talk to them. Yeah. You must sell your book there. You know, I'm going to do it. Let's, let's try. We'll do it. Okay. Because it's worth Thank it. You. you know, your book changed my life, changed my, uh, my practice. And you'll see what I'm going to do with... with uh, I, I used the information in the book to begin a work. I told you about it yeah. uh, a while ago. And uh, it's yeah. almost ready. And uh, I... I put a lot of stuff together and I did uh, a systemic thinking of mine. You know, everyone, every, every time you do something new, yeah, you put some, some of, your, of yourself in it. So I did that. Yeah. And uh, as soon as it's ready, I'm going to show it to you. I think, I think you're going to love it because you inspired me well, so sorry. much, you know. You are like... Well, but you're so clever and you take what, you know, you learn and you just, you, you already know so much and you've just applied. I can see what you've done. You've applied my thoughts and um, you, you are actively using it in a way that I feel doctors should. So thank you. Well done. So let's let's <laughs> tell let's let's people get to know you. So tell us your story. Where are you from? Okay. What happened to you? What changed your life and why you are now an icon, you know, in cancer treatment and you inspire so many people today. All right. Well I was born on a little island called Guernsey, which is close to France, but it's part of the UK. Well it's not part it's part of Britain. Anyway, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer at the age of 30. Cervical um, cancer. Yes. So I uh, had hysterectomy, so, you know, the, the chemo, radiotherapy, the normal treatments that you have. Um, I, that's all I did at the time. I didn't think about doing any holistic treatments. I didn't think about doing anything else. I just assumed they would cure me. How old were um, you then? 20? 30. I was 30. 30, yes, 30. So, Yes, and it had already spread to my lymph nodes, quite a lot of them at that point. Um, but I didn't really recognize just what an issue that might be and that the chance of spread was that much greater. Anyway, my mother, between me having my primary and my secondary, my mother actually got a stage four cancer. And she opened up my eyes to the fact that I really was in a dangerous situation. But she, she, I tried to get some treatments for her but we really didn't have enough time to make anything work. She was really quite advanced at this point and um, she wouldn't listen to anything about changing diet or anything like that. She just listened to her doctors. So I failed with her. And, you didn't you know, fail. Don't, don't feel like that. You didn't fail. You know why you can't say that? Because people at home never listen to us like they listen to people outside. You know, my father died of cancer. Mm -hmm. My aunt had lung cancer, smoker. My mom still smoked. So... Don't worry about that. It's not your fault. You tried. Don't. No, you didn't fail. You didn't fail. Yeah. If you tried, you did your best. Yes. I'm sure. Did my best. Didn't get anywhere. Um, and then I realized I had to do an awful lot of changes to my lifestyle, to the way I was eating, to sleeping, relaxation. I needed to look at my stress levels a lot more. There was an awful lot that I had to change. So I then incorporated all sorts of things into my my um, 
I cut out lots of things in my diet, like meat, dairy, obviously all the high glycemic stuff and bread and wheat, uh, things like that. So that all came out of my diet. I then did an awful lot of supplements. Um, I had ultraviolet blood irradiation, intravenous vitamin C. But how did it start? Uh, like, how did you start taking supplements? Where did you look for it? Because you did a massive research. No, I didn't. I, it was very hard because back in, this was back in 1999 when I was diagnosed with a secondary. The first one was in 94. Uh, so it was mostly through trawling through, I had Life Extension magazine. I had the Townsend letter. You're probably familiar with both of those. I had various journals that I was looking through. Uh, alternative medicine journals, all sorts of things, just trying to crib as much information as I could. You didn't have PubMed, and you didn't have Google yet, right? So it's, it's no, it's well, such I had, a hard yeah, work. Yeah, it was really hard, really hard work. And then I was quizzing my, so I had um, more than one integrated doctor. I thought I will go and see as many as I possibly can because I thought education here is king. <clears throat> it is what you need. Power is having control over the knowledge of what you need to do. And I felt totally disempowered by, you know, everything that was happening to me. And I felt I, I needed to get back that feeling of control. Uh, so it was education was my big, and it still is the big thing. And I still try and, you know, this is what I do now is I try and teach other people what they need to do. And it's terribly empowering. So I, I, I managed to keep my stage four cancer under control for quite some time, quite a few years. But then my blood markers started to go a bit wobbly. Uh, which and, blood marker did you uh, use? PKM2, which it's is... Usually doctors don't ask for it. That's why I'm asking. So No, no. It's, well, it's, a, it's an unusual marker. And my MMP2. And I was looking at my natural killer cells and everything else. And they were really suppressed. And um, my MMP2 was too high. Um my interleukin-15 was too high. Uh, there, there were also five, sorry, interleukin-5 was too high. So I was I was out of kilter with a lot of things. But my PKM2 is a marker of glycolysis, which is the fermentation yeah. that uh, cancer goes through. And this is an enzyme that goes up when you have cancer. And um, this was going up. And I also had myelodysplasia. Um, in my blood. So my bone marrow had been affected by the chemo and the radiotherapy I'd had previously. So I didn't want any more chemo. Uh, so I looked at trying to do something different. And that's when I started to look into, because the supplements weren't controlling it. That was the problem. I wasn't, whatever I was doing, it wasn't enough. So I knew I had to look at something else, which was more powerful. And that's when I started to add these um, what's known as off-label drugs. So these are drugs that are used for other conditions that I then use to help supplement into my uh, my cocktail in order to make it effectively starve the cancer more more um, more efficiently because it was blocking various pathways that the cancer used to feed itself. So like glycolysis, you know, I was taking melatonin, um, I was taking vitamin C, intermittent fasting, I was kind of pulsing into ketosis a little bit. So really lowering my GI index to try and starve the cancer. I was blocking glucose receptors with things like quercetin. I was taking berberine. Berberine is her. now commonly, commonly used as a supplement by cancer patients. But back then, you couldn't even get it as a supplement. I'd come across some information in um, a herbal magazine that was talking about berberine as part of uh, Mahonia aquifolium, which is um, it's a herb that the Chinese have used for a long time. And it had the berberine, the berberine, 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 oxyacanthin, all of these things. The ingredients were really powerful for cancer. Uh, so I had to take that as a tincture because I couldn't get it as a supplement. But now you can buy it easily yeah. as a supplement. Here, Everybody Here I can manipulate it in a compound pharmacy. I can manipulate yeah. everything I want. So. Great. Um, so that's uh, that was kind of the nuts and bolts of what I did. But um, so I then added these drugs, and um, one of them was lovastatin, which is one of the original statins. Hardly get that very easily anymore these days. Uh, and then I added dipridimol, and that's 
an antiplatelet drug. It doesn't decrease your plate. It stops your platelets sticking together, but it also blocks one of the cholesterol pathways as well. So I was blocking two cholesterol pathways. Um, and then I was taking the berberine. I was taking um, etodilac, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. It's an excellent combination. Uh, that was, yeah, yeah. So that was part of my combination. Um, and uh, what else was I taking? I later took cimetidine. You took which metformin helped. too, right? Yes. I didn't take it initially. I took it later on. So um, I, the berberine was kind of my equivalent of the metformin to start with. But about 2007, I started adding the metformin into my cocktail as well. So, yeah, that was that was also um, that became a standard part of my protocol going forward. But I already got it under control at that point. Um, and it so disappeared. It what happened afterwards? So tell me. So, so initially, I, I took it thinking, well, I don't think this is going to work. It's not, but I might, I might buy me a few, might buy me a few months, um, and you know, that's all I was hoping for. And then seven months later, my PKM two wasn't quite in the normal range, but it was pretty near enough, you know. Um, and um, blood markers all look fine. Uh, Did you do any image and, by then? Like PET scans, no. TC, CT scans? No, I no. Should have, no, didn't do any of that, actually, um, which is a shame. I wish I had done some more of those, you know, the, the evidence around that time. But anyway, it then started, the, the markers all started. So I dropped all the drugs because I thought I'm fine. And this is something I see a lot of cancer patients doing is they yeah. get better. Oh, I'm clear now. And then they, they drop stop. things too early too early and I see it again and again where people you know they think they're okay um, and then cancer comes back and it happened with me so next year again markers start shooting up so take all my um, cocktail again but this time I stay on them <laughs> and in fact you know, I've, I've come off them occasionally but mostly I take I still take diprinamol at night uh, and in fact I take a, a statin at night I've got the two dodgy APOE4 genes, two of them, like Owen Hemsworth. Um, so I know that I'm sort of at risk for Alzheimer's and things like that as well. And I know that it's linked to cholesterol problems and things like that. So I know taking those two for me is probably quite important ongoing. And actually, the statin um, could push you to Alzheimer's disease, you know. Starting to push you towards? Alzheimer's disease. Statins, they increase, they raise the risk of dementia. So maybe what what can you do well, uh, to improve um, that? It's uh, I don't know. Do you take sulforaphane? Yes, because yeah. Um, but for dementia, yes, statins can cause a temporary yeah. increase in dementia. But actually, there's there's studies to show that in fact statins for Alzheimer's, which is different to dementia, it's helpful. Yeah, let's talk I about it. it. Let's let's oh, exchange articles and papers. It's good. I like. I, I read a lot about it. I love it. So I, okay. I'll be glad to yeah. change yeah, to to okay. study together about okay. it. Yeah. But yeah, but then, right. how many supplements do you take at to in total? Like nowadays, numbers like how now? many supplements? Yeah, now. Okay, I don't take that. Many. I'm pretty slack these days. Okay, but after how, until when did you take all of them? After this. Uh, uh, this recurrence that you said when you when you were like okay yeah. I'm okay then yeah. you so started I'm again. Married, I'm taking a big cocktail for about another two or three years. I've gradually gradually tailed it off. How many supplements um, were you taking? Oh my god, a lot. So, you know, and I'd take some of them three times a day. Yes, it was, so, I know, like categ categories about, like berberine. About, how many? Yes, yeah, so I took about I took between twenty and thirty but sometimes three times a day. And then I take a different cocktail at night. You okay. know, so um, yeah. It's yeah. like uh, 25 different supplements. Yes. It's like 40 pills a day. Sometimes. A bit more. A bit more. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I see sometimes patients uh, telling me, doctor, but listen, I'm taking 10 pills in the morning, 10 pills in lunch. I said, listen. Uh, okay, cancer is a metabolic disease. It's impossible to tackle cancer with one drug because it's a metabolic disease yeah. which has many pathways. And then I show them your Metromap. 
I said, look, there's this huge, beautiful drawing, Jane McLellan did, you, have, you must read her book. And I tell them to read your book, and I said, you have to understand how cancer works. So I, I'm teaching my patients, I'm showing them, I'm, I'm recording like lectures for free in my YouTube so they can look at it, you know. Uh, when they said, yeah. oh, ketogenic diet will make you lose lean mass, I'll show them, no, it's, it's not going to happen if you have a nutritionist, if you have calories, if you have protein, enough protein, not too much protein. It actually prevents cachexia and treats cachexia if you have the right supplements. And actually, these supplements we use prevent cachexia too. So it's interesting yeah. that when you see that our supplements, what we use today, and the combinations can actually improve your immune response. You said your, your, your cytotoxic T cells, they were low. So uh, let's, let's tell people now. Okay, now they, re they are scared because it's a lot of supplements. But people, you have to understand, look, this woman was supposed to die when she was 35. She had male dysplasia. How many patients survive after chemo, radiotherapy, male dysplasia? And don't start another chemo after recurrence, and they survive. If you find someone, tell me. I'd like to interview them, too. So, so it worked, okay? So now we have to find out why. So this is what we're gonna start, what we are going to start talking about now. Why did it work? Yeah, because I yeah. completely agree with Jane McLean. I agree with the theory. I, I, I have seen it in my practice, and I really want her to tell you, because she was the first one. I mean, lots of people talk about, um, about uh, nowadays, metabolic treatments and stuff like that. But not many people have a systemic view of cancer like she does. It's a systemic view. I read it all, like everywhere. I looked, I looked into it because my father had cancer. I had to help him. It was 2017. There was nothing there. I didn't know about Jane, so I was looking in PubMed and trying to find something, you know. And I didn't find anything. So what I found, I used. It worked for a while. But now, seeing what she has accomplished, I think we we all we must listen to what she has to say. Like everyone should, because she's like. A, a uh, compendium of medicine, of metabolic uh, cancer uh, view. Yes, I mean, it, it may not be perfect, Jane, but you no, know. Uh, yeah, but, but you know what? I'm Listen, it's better, it's better than what we have. Not. It's better yeah. than what we have around. And you are a constant, a constant source of ideas, of research mm -hmm. ideas. Like the scientific community should be... In your course, I took your online course, of course, I did, because I read the book, and I was kind of lost. I said, okay, now this is something really big. I have to do something with this. I had another idea. Some of them I shared with you, about mushrooms and about other stuff, like when we met. I, I have more yeah. ideas now. I have great ideas. I want to sit with you and tell you about it. Uh, we can talk today about it, actually. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, and I think it's like a source of research, because you give so many ideas, you know? If someone is clever enough to stop to stop, look at and hear to what you're saying and dig into it. They are going to come out with a lot of, you know, research protocols. I mean, yeah, everyone should be yeah. doing this, you know, but they're not because they are just focused on continue with their stupid lives, eating sugar, sleeping late, you know, and taking medicines. That's what they like doing. So, yeah. And it's an easy way out to do that. But unfortunately, it is the way out. It's not the way. Yeah, it's, to, it's the way it's, out to, to the other dimension, <laughs> right? That's why so many people are dying every day. Yeah, yeah I know. So tell uh, us, tell so us about uh, the, the pillars of the... Let's talk about energetic pathways first. Then we talk okay. about the other ones. So. All right. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I do have four pillars of, of my, my approach and, you know, the exercise is key. Uh, they're all key. The diet is key. The supplements, because there are specific supplements that really work uh, very, very well. And, um, and obviously the off-label drugs. So it's a combination of all those things. One thing on their own is unlikely to, you know, to create a cancer-free zone, you really have to work on all four. Um, and I think exercise is the one that probably always comes to the bottom of the pile. <laughs> and you, <laughs> with, you with are a great sportist. People. Tell people what to do. So I sail a lot. Um, Even when I, you were sick, you were sailing, taking your pills. I remember in the yeah. book you telling this. She, was, yeah. she went sailing. No one knew yeah. she was taking so many pills. <laughs> No, I was trying to hide them. Rubbish. I couldn't do that. But anyway, so 
Um, yes, do a lot of sailing, do a lot of cycling. Uh, I used to play a lot of golf. I don't do so much of that now. Um, used to do a lot of karate in my time as wow. well. So, um, but I still do my Peloton regularly. I've got a Peloton bike, but I used to go cycling a lot before Peloton was even invented. You know, I'd go, I'd do quite a lot of cycling. Um, and um, I would prefer to do more aerobic stuff, but I've got really dodgy knees. But I, I would say that aerobic exercise plus weightlifting, actually, people don't realize that weightlifting um, is really, really good. I mean, there's a guy called Dave Bolton who has starved his brain cancer, completely cancer free. And he did it mostly by exercise. And he's got fantastic muscles. He looks amazing. Um, but he worked really hard on trying to starve his cancer that way. Not everybody can get those big muscles. <laughs> but he did. Um, he, he's done phenomenally well at using exercise to, to starve his cancer. It's his predominant thing. He used diet as well. Uh, I suspect he probably used a few supplements and things as well. But, but the whole point is that it's always a combination of stuff that you need to do. Don't rely on one thing. Too too dangerous just to rely, or certainly to to rely on your traditional treatment alone is asking for trouble. Most um, of the time, it is, got, it is yeah, yeah, yeah. You got stage three or stage four cancer. I would definitely do not rely on traditional treatment to get you better. You're lucky if it works, but uh, you you you're really taking a bit of a uh, a gamble with it. Um, so those are my main four pillars. And um, if you want to talk about the off-label drugs and the supplements, those are the ones that really, well, also the diet and the exercise also attack those metabolic pathways. But I've mapped out these pathways, um, as you say, in my metro map. So this is like little triangle in my book, which kind of splits the three macros of the diet. So you've got carb, fat and protein on the triangle and um, the carb is mostly glucose, the um, protein are mostly amino acids such as uh, glutamine. glutamine is the one. Um, and then the fat pathways at the bottom. So lots of those too. <laughs> and cancer unfortunately learns to feed on lots of those things. So it needs, it needs in order to create a new daughter cell it needs to make protein and fat. So it breaks down lots of protein and fat that comes in and recreates it to create those nucleosides, which are those sort of the little chunks of DNA to make the new nucleus. And then it makes all the organelles and the, the fatty li lipid membrane. So it's, it's constantly trying to do something in order to create its daughter cells. And if you can block its processes of being able to do that, then it starts to wither away because it's so hungry. Most cancer cells have about 10 times more glucose receptors on their surface than normal cells. So if, you, if it doesn't get that supply of glucose, it, uh, it starts to shut down. And that's what we want to do, shut it down. Uh, and eventually it starts to, to, to wither away and die. Especially if you, do, if you do stuff like that, for example, uh, in people doing under, under, undergoing chemotherapy, for example, they could do metronomic chemotherapy and use insulin pre-chemotherapy and take advantage yeah. of, those, of those insulin receptors and glucose receptors. And most of the doctors simply ignore this fact. They use high chemotherapy yeah. doses, even in those patients who can't tolerate it. They don't even know about insulin, which is something so old, like older than me, and no one talks about it. So yeah. uh, they think it's one thing or the other. They don't understand that if you're, take, if you're, if you're taking an action on the metabolic pathways, energetic pathways of the cells, they are more sensitive to chemotherapy and radiotherapy, right? And some yes. supplements even okay. make the cells more radiosensitive, like doxycycline, for example, yeah. like yeah. Osvelia, yeah. like yeah. Berin, you know? Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, really sensitizing. There are a lot of things that will actually sensitize um, the, the, the cancer to, to various treatments and, and that's what you need to do and it's again it's all about educating yourself looking up your particular type of cancer and trying to work out what is the best sensitizing agent for say the chemo that they put you on or even the immunotherapy PARP inhibitor targeted drug whatever it happens to be 
you know, there are ways to make it work better by adding different supplements and different off-label drugs and different diets, et cetera, that the, all of that will help it work better. And what have you seen, for example, in all these years after you began speaking it out and telling people about it? I, I'm your yeah. Facebook page. There's a Facebook page where doctors and patients change experiences. Sometimes I don't have time to go there often, but always when I go there, I, I have trouble leaving. <laughs> and I, I often find myself at midnight reading and reading and writing things. And I see many people having success stories with these uh, approaches. So uh, I'd like to tell, yeah. to tell us like one story that touched you in a different way, besides of your own, of course. Uh, but I don't know, something that was really unlikely and that this person was taking your, your steps and to manage or he managed to cure himself. Well, I've had one in the last week, um, which... Uh, it's a triple negative breast cancer. And, you know, that's really hard. Once it gets going, she had 20 Mets in her brain, like 20 brain tumors on top of the lung cancer and everything else and the, the breast cancer. And it, it had spread a lot, a lot of places. Um, so she was a mess. <laughs> um, but she had two young kids. She was absolutely determined she was going to try and give it her best shot. And she threw a lot at it. You know, it, it wasn't just a small cocktail. She did a big cocktail. But interestingly, she managed to get hold of sodium phenyl butyrate as on top of the usual metformin, statin, etc. You know, my normal kind of what I'd say is my normal cocktail. But sodium phenyl butyrate, um, what it does is it acts as a bit of a pro drug and it reduces the amount of glutamine in the blood. And I'd never seen anybody actually because I couldn't even, I didn't even know you could get hold of it. Anyway, I've now got somewhere where I know you can get hold of it. Uh, but amazing. She, I mean, she managed to just starve. I mean, I thought she'd have to do a, a big kill phases all the time to get rid of it. But I think she, I'm going to, I, I really want to interview her and do podcasts with her because I want to know exactly, you know, exactly what she did. It's helpful for me to know these sure. things, to actually sure. understand what um what were the triggers triple negative you know it's so awful um i mean it gets so many young women who are you know in the prime of their life they've got kids or something they're young kids and i see it time and time again you know triple negative breast cancer is um an absolute beast to get rid of so the fact that she'd just done it and i think mostly was starving it was phenomenal you know um, she did other things. She did, um, I think she did high dose enzymes as well. Um, coffee enemas, you know, she, she did the works, uh, awful lot of stuff just to sort of detox her body and get herself into, um, a situation where she was able to just target that, those, all those tumors in her body. And, you know, her oncologist is beyond bewildered with the whole thing. <laughs> um, doesn't understand what's happened. But, you know, that, that's a real great success story. I have had other triple negative breast cancer patients recover, but they've never been 20 mets in their yeah, brain. Yeah, very hard. Everything, you know, really hard. Um, so very impressed with her. Uh, and, um, yeah, no, I've had lots of people who just I sometimes get them when they come and do a consult. I think, right, okay, here we go. This is going to be a tricky one. And they go, by the way, I'm in remission and it's because of these drugs. So now I'm just wondering whether you should think I should do anything else. And think, oh, my God. And I, I had a doctor came on last week with kidney cancer. And he said, well, I just followed your book. And I'm now cancer free. And, and I'm oh, great. Well, what are you talking to me for? And I had another doctor the week before who I met actually in Florida. Phenomenal lady. And she did mostly the Kelly program. But she knows about me and she wanted to know whether she should start. And I said, for God's sake, you've done, you've done so well, you know, just getting where you are. Um, she added a few supplements, but she did high dose pancreatic enzymes, um, which helped to sort of, you know, allow the immune system to get into the uh, cancer. And that's something I did as well. At some stage, I would be taking high dose enzymes between meals. Yeah, you took bromelain? Um, sorry? You took bromelain? What did you take? Yes, bromelain, uh, just pancreatin. Um, uh, I took chymotrypsin. I took trypsin. Um, a whole range of different enzymes. Yeah, uh, always between meals, people, because if we take them uh, with the meal, 
it's it just helps digest and you have to take it in between meals with an empty stomach right yes yeah and that way it's acting on the cancer not acting on the food that you're digesting in your system so um but yes yeah, so i i constantly come across people and i there are more than one way you know this is a great thing about treatments there are more than one way to actually get rid of it and i'm not the kind of person to say just follow the off-label drugs or just do this or just do that i'm open to anybody who can actually get rid of their cancer brilliant and we want to know which are the best ways and how to amalgamate everything into the best system possible going forward so that people can actually really embrace a way of um, making everything work for them i think um, you have to be committed uh, and I feel the younger patients are definitely more committed than the older patients. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's very hard because it's more aggressive when you're younger as well. The older you get, the, the less your metabolism is kind of implicated and you don't, you don't have the cell replication. It's not quite as fast as when you're younger. So the cancers tend to be less aggressive. Um, but even so, you know, I have had some um, many, many miraculous cures. And you can look at positive progress on my Facebook group, uh, which I'm sure you'll share yeah. afterwards. But, um, you know, you can just type in hashtag positive progress and see hundreds of yeah, different and this, people doing this, All these cases, all these stories, they just show that the, the treatment the regular treatment the oncologists are prescribing is not enough. Not and enough. Is, people, I mean, the more I read about it, the more I look into it, the more patients I see, I realize that they are just losing themselves. They're missing it. Yeah. They're missing the point. Yeah. And their patients are yeah. missing their lives. So this is, yeah. this is a shame and this is a pity. And I think that, as, I mean, when I graduated in medical school, the first thing I said, okay, never do harm. Yeah? So... If you don't do harm, I mean, if the, if the risk, right, if the side effects risk is so low, why yeah. not? Of course, if you take the pridamol and if you're taking some other drug that lowers platelets and there's a bleeding risk, of course, every time I prescribe something, I check the yeah. interactions, the drug interactions. If I can't prescribe statin, not all the patients can take statins, right? And, uh, and it's not all, not every statin they can take. It's only some kind of statins like atrovastatin, simvastatin. Rosuvastatin is not indicated anyway. So it's not like, okay, I'll take any statin. No. And even when you take these drugs, the chemotherapeutic drugs or the immunotherapy, you have to check interactions. Sometimes there are interactions with quercetin or metformin. Usually not metformin. Impre I mean, I'm impressed. Sometimes quercetin, they have interactions. But sometimes... The interactions they describe is like, oh, this supplement inhibits the, the ABC transporter. Great. So we are helping Fantastic. the chemotherapy drug to stay in. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what we want. So when I look at this, I say, okay, yeah. so this is an interaction I want. Keep this drug. Yeah. You know? And, and sometimes yeah. people don't know what they are reading about because they don't study well, exactly. physiology. Yeah. They don't study the, metabol the metabolism of cancer and how it how it goes around our body and how it manages to get into us, right? But I think that nowadays it's uh, unethical, unethical not to consider metabolic therapy. As, as yeah. is unethical to offer sugar to cancer patients, especially when we have yeah. studies in Good humans. Brain. I mean, we have in col yeah. colorectal patients, a uh, study showing uh, improved survival rates, the lesser glucose uh, glycemic index of the diet. And not only survival rates, like you're looking at, 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 at real numbers here. It's not like a, a, yeah. an LDL measure when you're talking about cardiac risk that we know is nothing, right? It's something like dying. It's something like recurrence. And you have studies in humans. And when you tell this to oncologists, the only thing they always say, oh, you don't have human studies. You don't have enough evidence. There's nothing there. I said, have you looked into it? Did you look at least for it? Did you see any papers? Yeah. You know, I had a triple, triple negative breast cancer patient. I actually took the uh, uh, poster into MHS last, last two years ago. And she had a metastasis in her axilla. It was a lymph node, like four centimeters lymph node. So her prognosis wasn't so good any, anymore, right? No. With four yeah. chemotherapy sessions, the breast tumor and the metastasis disappeared. And there was nothing left. Right. Her oncologist was thrilled. He said, this is not possible. 
and she was doing intermittent fasting. She was doing ketogenic diet. She was taking supplements, and she's alive. And I mean, after she did the surgery, she completed the chemotherapy sessions. There was nothing there anymore. And she had everything, you know, immunohistochemistry, biopsy. It wasn't very elegantly done, and we could prove that it really worked. So tell me it doesn't work. I mean, we have so many stories to tell, so many patients treated. Yeah, yeah. Right? exactly. So many. Where do we start? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, and I've met, I, and it's so lovely just meeting some of the patient, patients that you know who have got better. So I was at uh, a conference at the Annie Appleseed in Florida a couple of weeks ago and I had patients coming up bursting into tears and saying, you saved my life. And that's that is, is, is actually a bit overwhelming, but it's so nice to actually meet people who've actually been there. They've done it. I didn't have to, they've actually done it on their own without me having to coach them or teach them. They've actually managed to work it out, find the doctors, find the treatments and actually and that's what I'm kind of trying to empower people to do, is to have the courage to go out there and have a go. Even, you know, doctors like you are not, I just want you to clone yourself because you're just not available to everybody. You know, I would love it if we had more integrative doctors available because we just need, and we need ones who are actually willing to go beyond the normal and actually stick their necks out and provide the off-label drugs, the low toxicity drugs that are going to help on top, you know. And this is this is a major major problem for for everybody really. Um, and Dr. Calibu, who was my doctor, who was my source, he died, right? Uh, yeah, he died last year. Um, but the care clinic is working in London, right? The care care clinic, they have the the, the care protocol. Clinic, yeah. But then they only do the four, yeah. you know, key drugs. So to me, that's great, but mostly not enough, I don't think, for for everybody. So, um, and there are some other, you know, other things like niclosamide, nitazoxanide. Nitazoxanide, I just saw um, come up in research only a couple of weeks ago to show that it helps stop the metastasis to bone for, for um, cancers like breast and prostate myeloma. Those are the ones that really head towards the bone very early. And, and there, the there's, a, there's a phase three study with mebendazole for colorectal cancer, a phase three study. Right. Five, uh, 500 right. milligrams of mebendazole, decreasing tumor size and mortality rates. Did you, it's, it's in the clinical trials and people don't even know what mebendazole right. is. Yeah. And they use a high yeah. dose, they use 500 milligrams. And it was well tolerated. It helped. So all these antiparasitic drugs, like uh, ivermectin, also there are some studies, interesting yeah. ones. Yeah, nitazoxamide, yeah. nabendazole. Yeah, and the ivermectin is very good for triple negative breast cancer. Um, works really well with immunotherapies. They're actually doing a, a trial on that as well. I think it's only a phase two trial, but they're looking at a new type of immunotherapy with ivermectin combined um so we'll wait and see what that says but uh yeah really really important stuff shown you know mice were about 50 percent of mice were becoming cancer free just using the immunotherapy and the ivermectin mice study but we're now doing it in humans so let's wait and see fingers crossed and let's hope we get similar results that would be awesome yeah, we have many studies in humans for most of the supplements for other diseases, at least showing safety, right, Jane? I don't see yes. why people should be uh, with fear. Of course, if you use doxycycline as an antibiotic, it can cause you dysbiosis. Yeah. But usually it's a 100 milligram daily dose. It's, it's like a low dose, right? We use it for acne, a much higher dose for a much longer time. So uh, most of the off-label drugs, they're safe. Of course, there are, they can be drug interactions. We have to look into them. But most of the supplements are, like, really safe, right? And yeah. uh, people shouldn't be so worried. Always, uh, when, I, when I prescribe a supplement, I always look for human studies when I'm looking at the dose. And always we're looking at clinical trials, looking for a dose. If the, someone has done it before, at least to see toleration, you know, like, oh, in this high dose, it's not well tolerated. Like albendazole is not a good choice. But mebendazole is used in children in Brazil. Like for ages, we used it. Like double yeah. the dose yeah. they're using it now. And this uh, 500 yeah. milligrams dose is very safe. And there are studies yeah. like in phase fact, three. 
Yeah, and Gregory Riggins, who's kind of the big instigator of mebendazole at um, John Hopkins, he was using 800 milligrams for um, kids with GBM, with brain cancer. So, you know, much mm. higher dose. Um, I have a few issues, though, with mebendazole in that it does upregulate a nuclear factor. So one of the inflammatory pathways, the nuclear factor kappa beta, part of that pathway um, yeah, but and you I think never, it's important. You, you never use mebendazole alone, right? I mean, at no, least we exactly. wouldn't. We wouldn't. No. Not in GBM. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So you need to have something to suppress that. Like at the Vena, same time as like the curcumin, like yeah. lots, like CBD yeah, oil, yeah. like lots of stuff. Sulforaphane. Sulforaphane. Um, and yeah, all of those things are very useful. And berberine as well, actually, really good for that. Yeah. Yes, I mean. Actually, when, if, you, if you take into account all the supplements you suggest and all the pathways you suggest, we should uh, tackle and, and look into them. Uh, you even say this in your book, right? I mean, if you only block this pathway, the cancer will go around it, which I think is genius because when I began studying, Jane, I must tell you, I was reading about it in, in the papers and the press pulse therapy. So you guys saw her saying this kill phase, kill phase, what's star phase, kill phase, press pulse therapy. And uh, most of people are not familiarized with that. Jane, do you want to explain what it, what it is about? Tell them. Well, I've kind of, I've kind of taken Seafried's press pul pulse approach. His was, um, press was doing a bit more diet and then pulse he'd be doing. No, he, he called press remember, ozone, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Yeah, uh, yeah. So a similar thing, but um, my, my kill phase is also much more of a pro-oxygenation. The star phase can be lots of, lots of, lots of different um, <clears throat> antioxidants and things like that, and that's fine. Then the kill phase is more pro-oxidant, so you really want to go for a pulse of oxygenation to try and wipe out some of those cancer cells. Um, because they are susceptible to oxygenating therapies, like high dose intravenous vitamin C, Love for example. It. I use it. Yeah, yeah, I know you do because you <laughs> use it um, in your ferroctosis yes. treatments. Yes. So, I which mean, I want to ask you about, can I? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, um, I know that some cancers are particularly <clears throat> hard to treat. I have been referring a few people with sarcomas directly to you because actually starving sarcomas I find really hard. They are one of the most difficult cancers I have found to actually get good results with. Um, so I think ferroptosis is kind of the key treatment that they need. Probably people haven't got a clue what I'm talking about with ferroptosis. If you've only just met me, never heard me talk before, ferroptosis is using iron uh, to trigger cell death by using oxygenating therapies. It's a bit more complicated than that. And you don't just take iron. You, in fact, for most cancers, you don't want to take yeah, iron. Yeah, you should avoid taking iron. You just take iron and it's absolutely yeah. necessary. Yeah, yeah. So um, depends on your ferritin levels, depends on all sorts of factors. But um, essentially, it's using iron, which cancer loves. And it's using its need for, mm -hmm. for iron to actually kill it. Yeah, cancer um, cells, they love iron so much that they kidnap it and sequester it inside the ferritin molecules inside the cells. So cancer cells have more ferritin molecules inside them. And it's very common to have high ferritin levels with low iron, free iron, and low saturation, the, the transfer in saturation levels. And the patient feels anemic, he feels tired, he's like very tired. And... Uh, you look at the other uh, signs of inflammation, they're not so high, like the, the, the ESR. And then you're, sure, you're certain that this patient is like, he has iron, he just doesn't have access to it. Because iron is so yeah. important and so dangerous for the cancer cell that it has all regulated. Because if the iron escapes, and if you give it stimulus for oxidation, this iron will be oxidized and will oxidize the, the lipid membranes in the cell and will trigger apoptosis. Yeah. And the cell will die. So it's something so yeah. dangerous that ap 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 apoptosis is very regulated in cancer cells, right, Jane? And if you know how to use it, 
intelligently, like inhibiting BCL2 and all these apoptosis inhibiting factors, and if you stimulate the other ones, like PACs and all the, the pro-apoptosis, like I love using the chloroacetate, like I use it a lot. And, um, and the, the theroptosis protocol, actually, came, who taught me? Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed al Saka taught me about it. He's my friend, he's your friend. He's brilliant, yes. he's an Egyptian doctor, yes. he's a specialist. And uh, I met him, uh, he had this poster about proptosis protocol, so I sat down by his side, I said, you, have, you must tell me everything about it, I won't leave your side until you tell me everything about it. So we talked for two <laughs> hours, and then I, I looked into it in the literature, and I saw so many papers from 2015 onwards, like lots of papers and growing yeah. literature about it, and I said, no oncologist talks about this. And they even, use, they even use some drugs, that uh, could help for optosis protocol, like for, for liver cancer and stuff like that. And um, I had a, a sarcoma patient. I still have her, thank God. Uh, she had a sarcoma in her knee. She was bedridden. I hope you meet her someday. I hope you interview her someday. Uh, she, she was bedridden. And uh, the doctor said uh, she had six months to live. And so she was how old? She was 30-something. 31, 30. 32, no, 30. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, oh, okay. And they, they actually, they took so many, so much time to make the diagnosis because the biopsies were not conclusive. She did like three biopsies. Right. By the time she, they finished doing the third one, uh, she did a PET scan and it was lighting up in her back and they didn't biopsy it. They just concluded it was metastasis and they said, you're, you're going to die anyway. There's nothing we're going to do about you. You could amputate your leg if you want, uh, it's not going to save your life because you have a metastasis, but I didn't biopsy it. So, and then she said, okay, if I'm going to die anyway, I, I'd rather not amputate my leg. I want to see other options. Then she lived in another city away from me. She found me on the internet, actually her boyfriend, which is so nice to her. He found me and she did an online, uh, uh, she saw me online. We talked I said, okay, I can't tell you not to amputate because if, this, if it's the only chance you have to save your life, do it. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you not to do it. If your oncologist is saying do it, I'm not going to be the one telling you not to do it. Trust only in integrative medicine. I'm here to do a complementary medicine to help your, your treatment work. And then she said, but there's no treatment. They never prescribed any treatment. They didn't offer me any option. They told me I should go home. She was using uh, a patch of morphine and she couldn't sleep, right. and she couldn't bend her leg, and she couldn't oh. dress alone. So uh, then I told her, okay, so I'm gonna give my best shot. You're away from me. You should come and do injectables and do ozone or, and lots of things I can do for you. But uh, let's see what we can do. If you respond, then you come. And then she started a ketogenic diet, uh, measuring GKI, you know, like always under three, and, and measuring ketone levels and blood glucose levels. She, she was like, Perfect, you know? And then she started taking my supplements. Okay, so after 15 days of taking my supplements, she began sleeping again. After one month taking, doing the protocol, and this is only supplements and diet, okay? No post therapies. Uh, wow. She was off the morphine patch and she could stand up. Yeah. Brilliant. Then she started going to the gym. She could go to the gym. Uh, yeah. And she was walking with a cane. Okay, so she made a decision. She came to Belo Horizonte. She was there. She moved to Belo Horizonte. At, at the beginning, she was like, she was going to stay for two or three months to do a, an IV protocol. And then we, I was seeing her every two months, every three months. In the beginning, we did uh, high doses vitamin C with alpha lipoic acid. And uh, then she had high ferritin levels. We did for optosis protocol. And... Um, we did, for, and actually, I made a juice for the ferroptosis protocol with watercress. Watercress? Oh, no. How do you call it? It's watercress, right? Which has PTC, yes. yes. Cucumber. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I took all the ingredients yeah, yeah. I couldn't buy, and I made a juice <laughs> for the ferroptosis <laughs> protocol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's this juice. So there's the juice of the, right. the ferroptosis protocol, which is with uh, uh, broccoli sprouts. I taught them how to germinate broccoli sprouts. In the fourth day, you freeze them to get most sulforaphane out of it, and then you can do uh, this juice in the morning. You take it out of the freezer. So I taught my patients. I have a video on YouTube. Yep. So I have these two juices, yep. one for the fructosis protocol, one outside the fructosis protocol, because sulforaphane inhibits fructosis. So, um, well, actually, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm 
reversing my thoughts on that because the sulforaphane will actually block the XCT antiporter, which is that pathway that cancer uses to get cysteine in. And even though sulforaphane boosts the detox pathway, yeah. the NR2, you can inhibit that with some things like brucetol, uh, trigonoline. Um, there are some things that you can take to inhibit the NRF2, but the sulforaphane may may be fine. Yeah, I, avoid, fine. It, I avoid it as a supplement. Like uh, I keep the EGCG though in high doses and I avoid sulforaphane because when I do the post therapy, I really want to give high dose vitamin C with this right. uh, protocol. So I usually avoid right. it, but um, yeah. Then we did this, and uh, and she was like, it was one year already, and she was alive. Like she should be dead in six months, and the tumor didn't grow. Actually, it diminished the size visually, and she was walking again without a cane, and she was doing trekking, and she never used CBD nor morphine again. And then we Brilliant. did. Um, uh, then Ahmed came for the first time, and. Uh, her, her lab tests were not good, so I think, okay, maybe there's something going on with this tumor. Maybe it's, it's becoming resistant to this therapy. And Ahmed did sonodynamic therapy on her, and that's when we, we began doing sonodynamic therapy in the clinic. So uh, yeah. he came, he taught my team, and we began doing it. And she, get a, she had a great response. The tumor diminished in size, but it was really vascularized. So we got into a limit that uh, we didn't get more improvements. And she was doing great. Like she was, she was doing tracking. She was feeling fine. And the soul metastasis. When we did the, the thermography, it never lit up. Never lit up. So I was always. I, I found an oncologist. And said, "Listen, uh, I mean, she doesn't have money to treat this forever and to pay for these supplements forever. It's very expensive for her. She's in another city." Uh, and this thermography never captured this, this tumor. Are you sure this is a metastasis? Because for me, it's really strange. She's not there. But, it's, but, not, but the sarcoma is very driven by amino acids mm. rather than glucose. So they don't always show up on PET scans. Um, and I have several sarcoma patients who come to me and said, well, it never came up on, never came up on a scan. Um, so I, th I think the amino acid side is, is critical, yeah, really. could be. Uh, this was like two years almost, one year and a half or two years since she was alive, then, I, I don't know, she saw someone, she saw an oncologist, and they said, no, it's not possible. You should be dead by now. This is not a sarcoma. And then she said, okay, I've been through this. It is a sarcoma. I'm doing this metabolic treatment with Janaina. She said, no, this doesn't exist. It doesn't make sense. It's not a sarcoma. We have to biopsy it again. So all again. Oh so she God. went to this, she did all the biopsy again, and it confirmed it was a high-grade sarcoma. And they said, okay, yep. you must operate immediately because <laughs> you're not dead because you're very lucky. She said, yes, I've been lucky for the last two years and, and I'm not dead because I'm doing this treatment, you know? No, okay, uh, I, we don't believe in this treatment, should be operated. And then they convinced her to do an operation on her knee. But it was a very hard one because the risk of metastasis was high and the risk of her losing yep. the knee, the leg was high. But she yeah. decided to do it, you know? Uh, I actually, I, I wanted to to do a more metabolic treatment before that. But then she, yeah, he yeah. said she should be dead by now, so she should do it, you know. She took, she decided to do it. So she did it. And after she did it, she recovered very quickly. She didn't lose her leg. But a metastasis appeared after the surgery. Yes. In the leg. Just, in the same leg. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Which happens all the time because in the surgery yeah. procedure, and we use celecoxid, we use propranolol, which yeah. is, I think is great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, before the surgery and uh, two weeks yeah. after the surgery. So I prescribed yeah. it to her. I use it always. But still she had a metastasis. And now she's treating. Now they began chemotherapy for her. But she is right. like the best patient they have, they've ever seen because she recovers too quickly from everything they do. Because she's doing yep. again the, the ketogenic diet and she's taking the supplements. So she's unlike yeah. any yeah. patient they've ever had. They, they, they keep telling her this, you know. But she's a warrior, I mean. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So yeah, sarcoma is um, a tricky one. I've I've always found it very tricky for for patients to 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 do well with that. But propranolol is a really useful supplement for them for sure. Um, and the ferroptosis protocol, again, big one, big one. So well done, fantastic result. 
No, I mean, it could be more fantastic if she was cured. So now I know, <laughs> I know there's still time to do that. Yeah. So, you know, I have patients who actually start and, and five years later, it takes them five years or something and they're finally there. But, you know, it's it can take time. It can take time. I, you know, I have a lot of patients who are like that and they have a little blip here and then they change things around and we have a look at jiggling things about and then they off they go again and then they get it down and then another little blip and then we get it back down again and you know um i have a lot of patients who are no evidence of disease they've always had a little bit of something and it gradually gradually goes down and that's a great thing that's a great thing and i love that I see some patients in, in these studies uh, about protocols, that, like the, al the alpha-lipoic, naltrexone, and hydroxycytric protocols. Usually they do only this, and like they do low-carb, they, they just don't write it down, but it's low-carb. Yeah. And usually, yeah. if you see the scans, it's like, okay, in the first six months, nothing changed. But this is already a win, and the patient doesn't realize that. If the tumor doesn't grow, yeah. it's a win. Yeah. But they want to be cured. Win. They want to be cured in a day. They don't understand that. And then in the subsequent scans, like one year afterwards, then the tumor disappears. Then they stop. Then the tumor comes back. <laughs> then they're there again. Because I think it takes time because you're not doing like a chemotherapy that kills everyone and you. You're doing a metabolic control. And it's fine if you find a way to control cancer, like you control hypertension. It's okay yeah. to. It's not bad. It's okay to have that. It's, it's okay. okay to have tumor. It doesn't mean you. it doesn't mean a metabolic protocol is failing. It just means that no. you have a different way of controlling a disease that might otherwise kill you. Right? Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And, and they feel fine when they're doing it. Okay, the fructosis protocol, it's difficult, right? Because sulfasalazine can be can be a problem. Yeah, yeah it has yeah. GI issues. Some patients don't tolerate it. I'm trying with yeah. um, I have these ovules and suppositories to do it rectally sometimes when patients can't tolerate it orally. Okay. Have you tried pipe along, you mean, long pepper? I don't have it here. Okay. But I can I can get hold to it, I think. Mm. Why? Mm. And even, and even well, that, that works um, very similar to sulfasalazine, ah, but it's okay. natural. And um, I think together they would probably work better. Um, a laparib, which is a PARP inhibitor, actually works really well, a bit like sulfasalazine as well. Yeah, some things, so that's another some things we don't have in Brazil, like I adapt. I have like a list of supplements and I say, okay, what can I get hold to? Yeah. For example, nowadays I'm dying to get a creatine orange and acriflavin in Brazil, and we don't have it. I'm dying to get yeah. acriflavin for bone metastasis. Yeah. I think it's the it's one of the ways, you know. I've been studying a lot about acidity and about uh, the vacuolar ATP ATP pumps and about um, acarbose and acarbose um, and uh, and about uh, how to in decrease the alkalinity intracellular and, and decrease the acidity outside to inhibit metastasis, to inhibit bone metastasis, and to kill the tumor with little number of supplements, you know, like acetazolamide, like acarbose, like acriflavine, and, um, and lactate inhibitors, and diet, you know. And I think yeah. this is something really big, because it's yeah. like, um, it's very specific. Amiloride, you know, it's very specific. I told you about amiloride when we met. It's very specific. And now I found so many papers about amiloride preventing cachexia which is great because it's... Yes, it's I have seen that too. Yep, and fantastic. And I, I, I had a patient come and see me in Florida and she was doing phenomenally well. You know, she'd had all manner of problems, but, and she was on a whole load of... She was on a Milleride because she had edema in her legs. And I said, you know what, just keep on that because it's really helping you. Don't come off that. Keep taking that because that's really helping your yeah. cancer, um, you know. And she didn't she didn't have any bit of cachexia. She was looking healthy and well. She wasn't healthy, but because she was riddled with all sorts of stuff, and she she was walking on a stick. But essentially, she looked healthy, and she was bright. She was breezy. She was an absolute gorgeous lady, you know, full of bubble and spirit and joie de vie. And I thought, fantastic, you're doing well. Yeah, you know, keep on that ride. Patients that yeah. actually 
they comply with the treatment and the diet, they look better, they feel better, and uh, yeah. the chemotherapy strikes them less than people who are not doing it. Because yeah. they, especially if they, if they manage to fast, like I have some patients, this triple negative patient, she was on chemotherapy, I know, once every 21 days, something like that, and she would be fasting 24 hours before the chemotherapy and three days after, you know? And in between, yeah. she wouldn't fast because she, she wasn't fed or anything. So she, I, th I said, okay, you're going to fast around chemotherapy because this is going to boost the effect and protect you. And she did that. And I'm, I'm pretty sure yeah. it helped. But all, not all the patients are like, you know, they're like, okay, I'm going to fast. I believe in this, you know. They don't realize how powerful fasting is for treating cancer, especially yes. during chemo and radiotherapy because it protects yeah. the healthy okay. cells. But not many people talk about it. And, uh, and you have the fast-mimicking diet. You know, Walter Longo did it on animals. It works. So some patients, we do the fast-mimicking diet. Five days a month, especially during chemo. It's great in GBM because temozolamide is five days a month, so we can do it. I did it in some patients. But uh, I'm very sad because some GBM patients, they come to me when there's nothing left to do. Like there's, uh, they say, okay, you have 15 days to leave. Then they find me, you know, like in desperation, they find yeah. me. They have 15 days to leave, go home to die. You have nothing else to do. Then they find me. So it was very sad because I usually tell them, okay, it's very little we can do in such a little time. I can help you have life quality and we can pray sometimes. If you have an IDH mutation, ketogenic diet can be very helpful for you. But if you don't, it's difficult uh, to expect that a metabolic treatment will help so fast. So yes. that's something people yes. should know as soon as you have a cancer diagnosis. Change yeah, your lifestyle. Absolutely. Don't wait. I met, I met this guy. I met this guy who's a friend of a friend. So he'd been told immediately, go and see Jane because m my friend Marcus just said, see her immediately. And um, I met him Sunday afternoon in the, in the cafe, and he still had stitches from his operation, which were done sort of a week ago. He was still fresh, new, just been diagnosed with DBM. <laughs> But yes, I've got him early. Shame I didn't get him before the operation, but I have him early. You yeah. know, fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, and, and, you know, I hope he does well. I'm Lucky hoping him. he does really well. But, you know, um, the earlier you can get there, the, the better you can get the results. And I just wish more people would know more about this and instigate some of these changes and come and see people like you earlier. Earlier. Early. Yeah, Makes I think sense. I think people are not listening sometimes, Jane. Because you're you're a physiotherapist, right? But yeah. I mean you, Yeah, but I mean you came from the health environment, you know? You studied anatomy, you studied biochemistry, yeah. you know? Yeah. You're not like anyone who doesn't have a clue about human body, you know, who's telling people yeah. something out of your head. You're someone who had cancer, who was studying biochemistry, who did your own research who came up with truths that are being confirmed study after study, you know? Uh, you should be respected. I mean, I look up to you. You know, I'm a doctor, I'm a, I'm a metabolism specialist, I'm an endocrinologist, right? I look up to you, you know why? Because you simply came with so much alone. And I say alone yeah. because I, I read your story, I see how people only look up to doctors who, does, who don't have a systemic view like you do. I see like very respected uh, personas there saying, okay, so all mitochondria are, are harmed in cancer. That's not true. They're simply not true. Actually, cancer has many types of populations in the same tumor, right? And yep. we have even uh, parts of the tumor who are doing glycolysis and then out of the blue, they begin uh, doing oxidative phosphorylation because it's not their mitochondria don't work. They have metabolic flexibility. And you said it in yeah. your book. If you block this pathway, it will go to this pathway. And it does. And this is it not does. speculation. It's published. Yeah. And reverse Wahlberg is known as the reverse Wahlberg effect. And yeah. it's not properly acknowledged by many people yet. No. Um, that actually a, lot of, a lot of the surrounding area of the tumor, like the immune cells, the stroma, the fibroblasts, they can be the ones that are actually doing more of the glycolysis, feeding lactate, and the tumor cells themselves can be feeding off that lactate, turning it back into and using the normal Krebs cycle to, to feed themselves. So yeah, it's, they, it's they, a mix. They, 
And right. actually, lactate is the hormone of cancer. It's the language. Yeah. Lactate yeah. is the most important signaling molecule in cancer. And people are not, simply are not looking into it. They think it's just a bystander, a marker of, of prognosis. And they don't see yeah. which, which diet reduces lactate the most. You know? Certainly it's not giving sugar to the patients and ice cream. Certainly it's not giving pasta. You know? So I think it's like a, it's a, it's cognitive dissonance, it's called, when you, it's in your face yes. and you're not taking action, yes. right? And even in yes. our field. No, the science coming at you because you are so sure that you're right. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, extraordinary. <laughs> and you know what? Uh, now, I always look in cancer like uh, as a systemic disease and like how sleep is so important and melatonin. I do IV melatonin. I do high doses of IV melatonin. I, do, I have bicalane injectable here. I have curcumin right. injectable here. I have dichloroacetate injectable. I have vitamin C. I have chrysine. So I can, I can make all sorts of protocols for my patients depending on the cancer, you know, which is great. I have viscum um, album here. I, I have fermented I, I viscum. You need to quadruple or even bigger than that. Just grow your practice 10 times and you should be getting everybody should be you know i think you should get all the sarcoma patients to start <laughs> you know but the thing is in brazil it's cheaper for foreigners for example if someone comes from england to be treated here for yeah. them it's going to be cheap for brazilians yeah. it's not so cheap because uh the supplements uh, are expensive uh it's easier to, to manipulate in the compound pharmacy you know for example right. i have this uh mushroom chocolate i make a chocolate it's a diet chocolate with mushrooms i put maitake turkey tail and uh and reishi ganoderma lucidum yeah. so i make this mushroom yeah, yeah. for immunity boost yeah. you know it makes people feel better it makes you in increase your th1 response it makes you inhibit your m2 macrophage so i, I like working with that and also the viscum album and valasta have you read about valasta the the this the, liquid the yeah the astaxanthin yep. it works like a P, pdl1 thing it, it, so i'm working with that too with patients who can bring it from abroad so some things we have here i thank god i have uh, this compound pharmacy i can make uh, liposomal drugs now so we have uh, methylene blue it's liposomal methylene blue we have um, yep. hydroxycitrate liposomal we have yeah, egcg brilliant. liposomal ahmed came and taught people yeah. how to do it so I, I have good treatments for, uh, for drugs. I can have everything, almost everything in the protocol. And I have injectables in the, in the clinic, and I have a zone. Uh, I still don't have uh, hyperthermia. I want to have hyperthermia. And I need an oncologist to do insulin. I have to do pre-chemotherapy insulin. I, I know it in my heart, so I'm looking for an oncologist who wants to work with me here. So if you if you're listening to this <laughs> and you I and you want to work with work. me, come. I need an oncologist yeah. here. It can, yeah. yeah. And I want a doctor to work in England that I can work with and train up to do all these things as well. Um, it would be we're desperately short, desperately short now in yeah. the UK. Yeah, I mean I don't want to study oncologists oncology because I don't want to prescribe chemotherapy. I want to, I want to be the no. metabolic doctor because I am a metabolic doctor. I am an endocrinologist. And I, there's so much to study. Right, Jane? I mean, these supplements, these yeah. phytotherapies, phytotherapies, these uh, off-label drugs, the more we read, yeah. the more we realize we know nothing and we need to study more. So it's not like uh, I really? want to be the oncologist. I don't. I, I'm, I'm yeah. pretty sure oncology has its place, right? I respect it. I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah. The thing is, I can improve them. I can improve what they're doing. I can help. It's not like a competition. It's not a charlatanism like they say it is. Uh, I'm backed up by science, sound science. At least, uh, uh, if you talk about fasting and ketogenic diet, the animal studies, we have meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials in animals showing good evidence and hyperbaric oxygen therapy with ester, ketone esters. So now I have this guy yep. who brings kinetics to me in Brazil. So I have ketone esters if I need, at least in radiotherapy. During radiotherapy, I like giving people ketone esters. So they're on ketogenic diet. Right. They take ketone esters. Yep. They're taking doxycycline. They're taking Vosvelia. You know? Yeah, yeah. Everything I know is going to boost uh, uh, radiotherapy because it helps. Yep. Yeah. So I think we have to, to talk more about this. We have to sum it up. You know, we have to team up. 
Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, low dose metronomic chemo is also something that people are not using enough. Because uh, the more you use of all of these drugs or supplements, the less of each one you need in order to get a synergistic effect. Um, a metronomic, low dose metronomic chemo works in a completely different way. Yeah, it doesn't kill your, your patient. <laughs> doesn't kill you. <laughs> and what it does is it helps reduce the VEGF, that um, the new blood vessel uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. So it's reducing that. And it's also boosting. So it sort of clears off some of the bad immune cells that are suppressing the ability of the good cells to get in there. So you actually get a boost of the T cells, uh, that, you know, the T infiltrating lymphocytes, the ones that are actually going to kill the cancer. The ones we want. <laughs> so... Yeah. Things like that are so important to know. Um, and I think stage three and four cancer, giving high dose chemo, how often is that going to work? You know, as I had high dose chemo second time round, but I had, was it two or three? I managed to get the dose reduced. All right. I did the full performance of this is going to kill me. I feel dreadful. I'm not having any more unless you reduce it. I refuse to have it. I feel so ill. I can't have it. And she eventually, she did, she dropped it down. Um, and here I am. Yeah. So, but at, if, you, at if least, you can get me the high dose, I don't think I would be. But you know, at least in these patients who can't tolerate chemotherapy in high doses, so many patients yeah. can't tolerate it and they just stop it. Why not simply stop it? wait for the patient to recover, and then start over again, low dose, together with the low dose. insulin pre-chemo, together with yeah. hyperthermia. You can do it inside the clinic, the oncology clinic. We're not trying to steal patients from you. Yeah. We actually go there and teach you how to do it. We, we go through with you. Uh, uh, I can be there <laughs> when you do the insulin. The patient's not going to die. We do it all the time. We do the ITT test, the, the insulin tolerance test. It's something like we do it all the time. We give insulin, wait for the person to have hypoglycemia, give glucose again. It's the same thing. Everyone does it all the time in endocrinology, but you do it before chemo, right? And the patient won't even feel sick because he's in ketosis, so the hypoglycemia won't even make him feel anything bad, right? It's not the, the thing. When you, when you have a hand of it, you know. Uh, and then supplements and the diet and the fasting, and then the patient suddenly responds. And it's not dead, like feeling bad, doesn't have all the side effects. And it's another kind of post therapy. It's okay. Yeah. So it's just that yeah. if they start with these patients, like, okay, let's try. There's nothing else we can do with you, right? Nothing else. Sorry. So, okay, let's try this low dose metronomic chemotherapy with insulin, hyperthermia afterwards, and hyperbaric oxygen therapy, supplements, right? Let's try something different. If there's nothing to offer anymore, why not trying something different? It's not magic. It's published. Slocum is doing it, right? It's published. Yep. Yep. Many patients treated, right? Uh, uh, insulin pre-chemotherapy comes from Mexico. Like there's this guy yeah. decades ago who wrote about right. it, you know? And no, yeah. one's, no one lo even remembers. Like, hey, guys, this is being said like decades ago, like ketogenic diets, you're fr so afraid of eating fats. You can do it Mediterranean diet, eat avocado and nuts, you know, you're so afraid of a diet which is done 100 years ago and saved, saved thousands of lives of children with uh, epilepsy. We're not proposing yep. anything so new, are we, Jane? Nope, it's not new. It's actually very old, all of it, really. Yeah, barberine <laughs> and is used from, for hundreds of years. Yeah, I mean, Ayurvedic <laughs> medicine in yeah. Chinese... Traditional yeah. medicine is done for a thousand years, like yes. or more. And some of those, and we're only really starting to appreciate the oh, power yeah. of some of those Chinese medicines. I mean, amazing. Like Dunshan. Dunshan. Love it. Dunshan for <laughs> bone metastasis. Oh. Yeah, yeah, love it. Uh, for, and, it and on its own, it apparently helps to stimulate uh, ferroptosis and breast cancer. Um, Dunshan is great. So, yeah, yeah, it's very good, very good. So many things. Many things. Many. So we could be here like for ages talking and like I could talk to you for like a week nonstop and I wouldn't even feel sleepy, but I know it's late there. But I want you to tell people 
about uh, your new book, which talks about fructosis. I read it already. And also about your online course. And I think all doctors who want to start learning about, about this should take Jane's course. Uh, I did, I, I do have a course in Brazil, but I, it's not online and it's not always, so it's not available. And usually when we do it, not many doctors come because it's uh, in person. And you know, when we tell them it's very cheap, you know what they say, Jane, they say like this, oh, but I don't treat cancer patients. I don't like cancer patients. So I tell these doctors, if they watch me and they watch this podcast, you don't have a choice, my friend. <laughs> in 10 yeah. years time, you can yeah. count at least two out of 10 of your patients will be with cancer. You know why? Because this is the most uh, prevalent disease nowadays, and it's the high, you know, in the, in the ranking of killing people, it's cardiovascular disease and cancer everywhere. So, and it's not going to get any better. And the no. health, insurances, health insurance won't be able to pay for the new drugs. You'll be in a dead yeah. end. The oncologists are walking to a dead end, and they don't see it. They are. They are. They you are, are so right about are, so. And you're right also that the um, doctors, the integrative doctors, are probably too scared to treat cancer, a lot of them. I can see that. I just wish they had a little bit more confidence. Oh, and that's where you need to be teaching more. Um, uh. I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. So, uh, yeah, I have my online course, which people people read my book. Um, some people get totally overwhelmed, and that's perfectly understandable to get overwhelmed with it to start with. Uh, most people read it once, and then they leave it for a week, and then they go back to it and read it again. And uh, sometimes it takes about three reads, and then they really start to get it. And then they do my online course. Once they do my online course, I think the light bulb starts switching on. Yeah. Um, and that's the important bit. Uh, is to really get people to understand it's all about combinations to block those key metabolic pathways. So you're not allowing it to reroute its way around. Um, so, yeah, uh, course has done very well. And that's on Teachable. Teachable, if you look up teachable.com uh, and then how to solve cancer, you'll find it. No, I'll put, um, a, I, I'll put the link here just under the video right, so right. you won't have to look and for it don't worry it will make it easy for you perfect uh, perfect and people can put in a discount for you so kernan um i probably pronounced that incorrectly 10 perfect we'll put, we'll put that in the in the link as well um and my book is on amazon and it's on my we'll translated um, into portuguese eventually i hope i can uh, yeah, be part of I it i really hope so. i really hope so I need to find a Portuguese publisher, ideally. Um, I'll find I've one got for you. Publishers. I'll find one for you. I'll can do you, it. That would be awesome. I'll find one if for you. If you can find somebody for us to approach, I will. that would be perfect. Perfect. I will. Thank you. We need to Thank do this you. because uh, this information has to be wide open. It can't be, you know, segregated anymore. And you should yeah. sell your book and Metabolic Health Summit, you know. It's very. It's a very important book. Everyone respects you. Uh, We'll make a motion. <laughs> I couldn't buy it there. I looked for it and it wasn't available. Yeah. I would have yeah. read it on site. <laughs> but I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad Nasha told me about you. I'm glad I bought the book. I'm glad, I'm glad I read it. And uh, I, I can tell you that it, it began my work like a real work. Because before you, I was only looking at all the mitochondria are failing, all mitochondria have problems, you know? And if you, if you do ketogenic diet, it's enough, and only some, some other stuff. And I see it didn't work so well. So when I, when I read your book, I said, okay, because I'm an endocrinologist, everything makes sense. I said, no, this, now this is something yeah. I, I grab my attention. I have to work on this. So I began my work about this, and then I built my... my, my I have this Excel dynamic table, and I'm improving it now. I want to publish it, and I put some other stuff too. I have like this uh, mind master. <laughs> How do I see cancer now? It's very confusing, and so I put it into the paper. I said, okay, now I see it. You know, so I hope it helps people too, and I hope we can work together. You know, I hope we can design stuff together and 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 have a research group together. Because we need this. Yeah. 
we need this. Yeah, we do. We do. We and do, if, we and do. If, and if we stay alone, Jane, uh, the I system know. will crash us, you know, because it's easy yep. for them. And, and that's, I mean, they don't want to change. It's a lot of yep. money, you know. Like one, one treatment, yep. one of our treatment, like if you buy all the supplements, I don't know, you spend like $10,000 if you do everything. I don't know how it, in Brazil, if you do everything, that like all the supplements, they cost for four months. The supplements will cost, I don't know, 7,000 reais, which is like one and a half, one hundred and one thousand five hundred dollars let's say one wow. one vial of treatment in brazil cost five fifty thousand dollars fifty thousand reais which is ten thousand dollars one vial of one of Gosh. the drugs they do so it's not a, yeah. an expensive treatment if you look at yeah. it this way but the health insurance yeah. system is not prepared or doesn't want to treat yet now right but if they see potential, if they, if they're, because they're spending thousands of dollars in failed treatments, who doesn't work, and actually they, they extend lifespan one month, forty five days, I know. and yeah. miserably, right? Because the, the quality of life is miserable, and they're like promising patients, the world, but never comes, right? It's like I immunotherapy know. works for thirty percent of the patients. It works for a while. If you have the, yeah. the beginning, okay, great. If you don't, if you don't have a, a targeted mutation, you know. So, for stage three and stage four patients, what can we offer to these people? You know, are we offering yeah. everything we can? Are we doing our best? At I mean, in evidence-based medicine, are we doing our best? I can assure you, we are not. It, it and I can assure you we're not as well. Yeah. It's just so obvious to me, so obvious to me that we're just not doing enough, not doing enough for these people. Um, and I just wish more people would understand and acknowledge you need to do these extra things. And um, it would be so much better if we had more doctors. Uh, I want the NHS to try and fund some of this somehow. Somehow we've got to have an integrative clinic that actually provides all of this for cancer patients. When we need more of them. We need them up and down the country providing the treatment for, for cancer patients that yeah. are cheaper, yeah. cheaper and easier than the horrendously expensive treatments that they're currently on. Yeah, and if you if you compare yeah. the price, it's it's much cheaper. It's like ridiculously cheaper. But if you make the patient pay for it, all yeah. of it, for the patient, it's expensive. So unfortunately, nowadays, yeah. it's not easy. Uh, it's expensive. If you come from abroad, it's not so expensive. If you compare in the other places in the world where integrative therapies for cancer are provided, uh, like in my clinic, I have the ozone, I have the, the injectables. We have hyperbaric oxygen therapy, not in the clinic, but we have it in my city. If the pa if patient can pay, we can do it. And we have a compound pharmacy. It's not mine. Unfortunately, because if it were mine, it would be cheaper, uh, but it's not mine. But they, they are very keen on studying and researching. And if I tell them I need this drug, they, they provide it, you know. I yeah. need resveratrol in cream base because in cream base is 65% bioavailable. And if you take resveratrol by mouth, it's 1% bioavailable. So if you micronize it in Pentravan, you increase the bioavailability to 65%. So I can use 150 milligrams three times a day in the skin. So you imagine how much resveratrol I have. And I have injectable resveratrol too. So I do it intramuscular in the clinic inside. So it's different when you have these options. I have bicaline, I yeah. have curcumin, you know. It's good and you can change yeah. the protocols. And it works, you yeah. know. So uh, this is, I, unfortunately, I still don't have uh, the oncologist to offer. <laughs> I have an oncologist who is open. Do you have? Yeah, good. But she doesn't do it. Okay, what about? Photodynamic therapy, you mentioned that I you I have can sonodynamic do. and photodynamic therapy in the clinic, oh, yes. Okay. We still don't have it Perfect. with the uh, fiber optics, which we will. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we, are, we have a doctor who is so going to train. To yeah, you insert the fiber um, optics inside and you do sonodynamic therapy inside. And I want yeah. to get hold into better uh, sonosensitizers. Uh, yeah. And we have, we have now yeah. uh, some of them, but I, I, I want to have better ones, especially for bone metastasis patients. Uh, sometimes I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I have these ideas, and then I start Googling it, and I can't sleep. And then I design a protocol, so I start studying. You know, I don't know how to explain that, but it happens <laughs> in a while. 
it happens sometimes. Yeah. So, so I did this, and now I, I'm up obsessed with some sonos sensitizers and some machines. So we are buying stuff, new stuff and improving the clinic. And I think in, in a year time, we'll have like a good surprise in Belo Horizonte. <laughs> Brazil is nice. I mean, it's, I live in the mountains. It's a very nice place. And I think some people from abroad will be happy to come and be treated here. I hope so. <laughs> well, I refer quite a few people to you. So um, they should go. They should go. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. Yeah, we will change yeah. the information in the site. So it's a direct yeah. line to the clinic because sometimes uh, I yeah. don't get emails. They go to spam. I see done that already. Oh, great. You, yes, you gave me a change of um, information for my website. So I think I've updated that. Oh, I hope so. Uh, I'll check. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. check it out. We have to do this yes. more, more often. Yes. So yes, definitely. Love this. Thank you. So much information for people to take on board. I think we rattle through a lot. Let's just say a lot. Yeah. So people just we are gonna have to cut it into bite-sized chunks probably for people just to digest maybe a bit. But fantastic. You know what we could do? We could do like short lives about you know what's something that uh, I love? I find it beautiful if it wasn't tragic, metastasis like epithelial mesenchymal transition and supplements that tackle into this. Uh, I think this only this subject deserves a whole podcast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We could do it and explain to people why Dipridamol is so interesting. How does a metastasis happen? And it, we can be yeah. very uh, the, uh, simple in explaining it. I have like a whole idea I can, ex I can say. We, we should do it. Let's, let's arrange it. Okay. okay. Can I interview you? Yeah, All right. that's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll be glad. Okay. Okay. Thank so, you so much. Thank you, Jane McLeland. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough. I'm so glad I had this opportunity to talk to you and to to learn from you and share a bit of what um, now it's my passion. Uh, I can say I treat endometriosis the way I treat cancer, and I think you should look into endometriosis too, because uh, these patients suffer a great deal. And we can uh, talk about it. You can interview me about endometriosis, and you'll understand why. And my experience, my clinical experience, is already good in it. So let's talk about this. I think you, sh you would help a lot of people, not changing anything you say. Yeah. But it's a whole yeah. set of people, of women suffering, yeah. having yeah. huge surgeries, having metastasis, infiltrations in the bowels, having pain, and nothing yeah. works. Nothing works. So no one is looking at them. So I think you should look at them like I am looking at them. So we, we can talk okay. about this okay. if you want. Great. Super, super, because really I don't know any specific treatments for endometriosis. We'll talk. You do know. You do know. Oh, okay. Actually, you know. know. Actually, you know. It's just, you're not just <laughs> looking into yeah. it. Like the oncologists don't look yeah. into it, you know? No one looks yeah. into it. But we'll look yeah. into it, and we'll talk about it, and you'll see yeah. how much you know. You know a lot. And then you'll okay. see a whole new market of people dying of pain with no help yeah. you'll yeah. see okay yeah. <laughs> so now i mean all of you curious right <laughs> yeah so thank that you so fantastic much into it. okay super to talk to you thank you so much thank you so much bye bye okay bye